morning, everyone. Oh, that was loud. Uh, <laughs> it was a little unexpected. <laughs> so uh, I got a loud mouth to begin with. So that's just like, boom. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is, we're on day two. Day two. Uh, how did everyone feel about day one? Okay, I feel like the comedian right now. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's a good coffee. We keep hearing it. It's a great coffee, which is awesome. Uh, for those who are online, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. And we know we're going to be filling up throughout the day. So um, we want to be able to talk about immediately is just talk about the code of conduct. Uh, we want everyone to feel welcome. If you don't feel welcome, please talk to someone at the event staff. It's vitally important. Uh, we want to make sure everyone's heard. To be sure that everyone can be heard when you're asking a question, go to one of the microphones because it's vitally important for the people online to be able to hear you. And if someone is able to speak from the crowd, um, as a presenter, if you can re-quote re the question, so that way we can frame it for the people online that will help them out tremendously so they don't feel like they're just watching this and feeling left out at all. Does that make sense to everyone? So if you got a question, get up a couple seconds before, make your way to the microphone that's located here, and I believe there's another microphone right on the second level. Uh, if you can raise your hand, there you go. I don't know your name. Thank you for participating. Uh, <laughs> uh, the right there, so that way we can make sure the people online can have a flawless experience as well. Um, and so, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and so it's it's I'm actually gonna feel like it's my Kanye moment because I have a presentation, uh, and not only am I doing an MC with Alex as the other MC. Uh, can you stand up, Alex? So I'll probably be calling on until so people as people come in. We'll just make sure we introduce people uh, to the house rules, uh, code of conduct, uh, and who the MCs are, so it doesn't feel like okay, are they bum rushing the stage because they're protesting, uh, or are they just, you know, are just making sure the event can be able to flow? So my name is Jonathan Moore. I am a founder and CEO of Rowdy Orbit. And what Rowdy Orbit is, is that we provide high-speed internet to under-resourced community. Some people call them low-income. Some people call them black, white neighborhoods. Uh, because we see this as a vital aspect of, most people say the digital divide, but we look at it from a different point of view. We look at how the divide is now digital. Because most of the time, the hero is emerging technology, but the hero often neglects what happens in the community and the people that we serve to overshadow a lot of the responsibility that have become institutional and structural biases, racism, uh, as well as economic extraction. So we tackle everything from a point of now the divide that is always consistent within communities is now digitized. And by doing that, it allowed us to really work with John Hopkins University uh, in two areas. I-3 um, is with Adler Archer. Is Adler here? Not yet. Uh, Amber, you want to stand up? Because you're the representative of I-3 right now, but outside of myself. That's Amber Royal. She works with Adler Archer at I-3. If you have any questions about I-3, now you got a face and a name. Uh, or you can ask myself, and I can introduce you to Adler, and we can have a conversation. Uh, and uh, um, I-3 is really focused on how do you bring research, emerging technology, and community together to really begin to solve a solution where Hopkins doesn't want to become the, the, the owner and the practitioner of the narrative. And it's how do we put people first to become what we start to frame it as sovereignty, but we take it one step further when we talk about community sovereignty. Uh, and community sovereignty is very important where we tend to, most of the time, when people go into a community, they stay there longer than what they should. And it becomes an extraction effort, not only from a monetization standpoint of view, but from a cultural standpoint of view, uh, to the point when they leave, so do the resources. And so does the knowledge base. So when you look at community sovereignty, it's reversing it from making sure those things stay, but also lessening your footprint over time. And we also work with John Hopkins School of Public Health because we said 
in order to build out community sovereignty, we need to tap into the health of the community and what exactly does that look like. And so what that tends to look like is that we really focus on how do we start to tackle key aspects around social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are key pillars on how community, uh, how community tends to grow, how community is healthy, how community looks at things, and also how we can tap into community context. And so that allowed us to really work with community-based organization. And you'll hear me say this acronym. If you talk to me, I'll say CBO, which is community-based organizations, um, because they offer a vital asset into a lot of the neighborhoods in which we serve. You know, And so as we talk, as people talk about data transition and data, community-based organizations, they aren't the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon of data. They are one degree away from and often the authors of collecting rich and pure data that people are constantly looking for in the communities that we serve, that individuals that are impoverished or fall below or, or, an on or at a poverty line. And so we said, okay, well then the way that we can do this is how do we leverage broadband infrastructure to really tackle the divide? And you talk to people, big infrastructure, it's like, I don't mean, I don't care. That doesn't make sense. You know, that we, we want the ROI and we're like, okay, no, there's a different way that we can go in and use technology to build out the health of a community. And so the way do we do this is at first we're like, okay, before we do anything, we got to figure out we're, we're internet guys. We're internet people and we're broadband people. And it doesn't make sense if we don't start, we don't start at our roots, put this thing into the ground and then go from there. So what we do, we use a technology called CBRS technology. This is very reminiscent of LTE. Um, and we go in and we bring fiber into a building and we create a two mile radius, like an umbrella. Hence the umbrella, like an umbrella. And so within a two mile radius, we said, okay, well then within that footprint, how do we really get into what does the health of a community look like? And where do we start? And we said the first place that we need to start is we need to start with workforce development, not workforce development from a sense of just training and there are no jobs. We need to do it in a way that we train people to become, first they were considered Wi-Fi technicians, and then we started to figure out, well, we need to make them sound more like engineers. So we're actually pursuing our, uh, what's it called, the um, uh, state apprenticeship in the state of Maryland to, be, to train people to become telecommunications engineer so we can bring aspects of coding, we can bring aspects of G, uh, GIS technology, uh, we can bring aspects of actually building and really start to think about how do we start to solve issues using emerging technologies that are within the communities, but also instead of just talking about issues, we're talking about issues regarding to health and equality. Because remember, if we're tacking the social terms of health, we need to start from someplace. So we said, we'll start with health. And so we actually train people within a two mile footprint to become um, telecommunications engineers. Uh, and we recruit from various different community-based organizations. So that way, when we recruit people from that neighborhood or those neighborhoods, they're usually about within a two mile footprint. So in Baltimore City, there are over 250 neighborhoods. And so within that two mile footprint, we make sure that it covers about uh, anywhere between nine to 15 neighborhoods. And usually when we recruit someone to work for us that are from those neighborhoods, they're usually second or third generation, which is awesome. Oh, damn, that's, I thought I had 15 minutes. Um, so <laughs> I love the timekeeper, so let me speed this up. Uh, <laughs> and so the way that we go about this is that you said we have to really look at the Alice Report from United Way of Central Maryland, where they focus on people that focus on uh, that make thirty-nine thousand dollars or less, because those individuals they make too much receive social services, but they don't make enough money to get past a certain point, so they're still living paycheck to paycheck. So we wanted to make sure that it's rooted in health inequalities, but also with how to, what's the what's the medium household range of a household income to really build out a healthier community knowing that I only have a couple minutes left to speed through. So we said in building out a healthier community, we need to work with CBO, uh, community-based organizations to really within our footprint 
to not only bring internet service, high-speed internet service at various different levels, ranging from $30 to $35 all the way down to 10 that's above FCC standards for high-speed internet, but we need to look at uh, community-based organizations to become showrooms where we can bring in IoT sensors that are related to those health inequalities that plague those communities. And what we're seeing is that a number of communities at intersection there in Baltimore City is high rates of asthma, um, where certain communities have uh, the number one rates in the country for death for asthma. So we said if we go into community-based organizations, how do we bring in indoor, outdoor air quality sensors? So that way when people can touch it, feel it, sense it, you know, from an emergency technology standpoint of view and really start to understand it, now we can make the leap into putting these aspects of technology in their home and working with in individuals from the community to understand, well, how do we make this sustainable? Because we can put an air purifier in everyone's home, but not everyone can fill can afford the, the $50 to $130 plus cents, uh, uh, filters that will maintain that. And so Node, was it, um, nodecollective.org talked about this yesterday, and I'm going to highlight what they said when they said putting the electric hot plate on the stove to reduce the emittance of, was it gas that's coming into your home? I was like, this is perfect. That's perfect. You know, because those are the conversations we want to have with people because that's sustainable. You know, uh, being able to have an air filter is, is not. And so we looked at these community-based organizations. How much time? We looked at, okay, thank you. We looked at these community-based organizations as nothing more being an IoT showroom, a museum, and having people come in to experience it and just curate it, but bringing levels of emergent technology at a slow and integral pace. Uh, pace so that way we're not over rushing everyone with this new technology and then you got to figure it out it's like no how do we work with you how do we have community-based organization conversations how do we make you understand the data that's being acquired and in the end how do we move you into an action where you can advocate for yourself from the bottom up rather than the top down so when you go to uh, organize you can have a qualitative and quantitative conversation that's rooted in science in order to move the needle on various different levels. And so we really try to focus on what, how do we do this together, but also in a way when we build out these hyper-local ISPs within a two-mile radius that we lessen our footprint. And what I mean by that is not staying too long to move from ownership to actually management so that way the community can grow, grow their systems that they see fit without asking us or having permission or eventually having all these community conversations, thank you. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on community sovereignty, but also helping communities in a way that when we leave this asset behind, that we've done all the hard work, we've got the policies in place, we've got the processes in place, we got the relationships and making sure the revenue is there because all this sounds great. If they're not making money, then this doesn't work. And so, that's the conclusion of my conversation. My name is Jonathan Moore. I'll open it up for questions real quick. Any questions? Yes, can you go to a microphone real quick? Thank you. You mentioned natural gas stoves as an issue. Are you seeing asthma worsened by natural gas heaters in Baltimore also? Time's up. Um, let me answer this question. <laughs> <That's perfect. laughs> you know, I, we don't know yet. You know, and so the first thing that we do is that we go into communities based on the data that we can acquire. Um, around health inequalities, and then we talk with the community-based organizations, uh, and then we start talking to the community. We validate the data before we make any type of um, recommendations. And so the reason why I brought that up, because it's when we go into, when we see a lot of older homes, a lot of people have no idea how this asthma thing is happening. They don't know if it's the lead and the paint, if it's the radon, if it's the PMs, um, if it's the local plant down the street or the salt mine, or if it's old faulty equipment within their home. 
And I love how Node Collective used that as an example um, where it was rooted in what's sustainable for that particular family rather than parachuting in and saying, well, okay, let me do a high recommendation. Let, let me do a recommendation that I know you cannot afford. And then what happens is you make that recommendation, they can't afford it, then it falls off. Then you're just parachuting in and you're not being an honor of community. Uh, and I think that offers deeper context to it. And if you want to know what that means, I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. But it's, it's just not viewing it through your lens. It's actually listening, being an active listener, and coming up with a solution that's going to work. So it's something that people can do every day without them having to change up their lives. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. All right, well, thank you all so much. Timekeeper gave me wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.